Please welcome Drs. Kelly O'Hara and Anthony Roth Costanza. Hi, thank you. Thank you for being here, both of you. Um, and before we get to the, the theme of the evening, which is your remarkable facility moving from discipline to discipline in the performing arts, I do want to discuss a very specific way that the two of you, your careers intersect. And that is that you're both integral to two of the most powerful productions to grace the Met Opera in recent years, Akhenaten and The Hours. Um, both productions directed by Phelan McDermott, as it turns out. Anthony, let's start with you. What has your work in Akhenaten over the past sort of half decade contributed to your, not just your the development of your career, but you as an artist? Well, Akhenaten has been extraordinary um, and has made me grow a lot. You know, it's a three and a half hour opera in which nothing really happens. Um, <laughs> It's in ancient Egyptian, and uh, it's minimalist music. That, so just, you know, the same same basic musical figure in the same key for three and a half hours. Um, so the question becomes, how do you tell a story? How do you engage people with that? And um, trying to find an answer to that and letting the, the human emotion come through this very abstract material has taught me a lot about theater. Um, Working with Phelan McDermott that we do is talk about different movement qualities and different, you know, as they connect. I don't know if you did this with Phelan, um, but, you know, thinking about how to perform, how to command an audience's attention, how to express your own internal intention um, with the, our normal devices of communication, that being, you know, a f musical phrase even, you know, let alone words or uh, things like that. Um, that's been really fascinating and has taken me to what I feel like is the edge of possibility. Well, that's fantastic. Kelly, no ancient Egyptian in the hours, <laughs> thankfully, but tell us about Laura Brown, your character and your work developing her, starting in the depths of the pandemic, I believe, leading through Philadelphia and, and right up to the Met. That is correct. Uh, yes, no Egyptian. Uh, playing a 1950s housewife is something that I can, um, that I've played before, but not in this way. Um, also, I think that it's a very human character as opposed to, what we're talking about here. It's a very human character that you might have known, she may have been your grandmother, your mother, yourself during certain moments of the pandemic, cooking your third meal, washing dishes for the third time, wondering what your other, uh, what were the other qualities of your life that you ever admired? You know, you're standing there by yourself, tired. Um, those are the small aspects, the larger ones, mental health, um, sexuality. You know, playing her, finding those, very identifiable qualities was not a hard job. Um, bringing them out in, in a genre like opera was more difficult for me. Um, I'd be much more comfortable if there was a, maybe a camera coming in and, and, that, and that internal thought was, was more received in a small, subtle way. So to then marry that with music and sort of a, a fourth wall presentational value is, is, a, is a challenging thing that I'm, I'm still learning every day. We only have one more performance, and I'm, I'm just getting it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, talk about cross-discipline. You, you, in your musical theater world, you're eight shows a week. Here, you're eight shows, period, right? I mean, yes. is that an adjustment that you have to make? Or? Well, I'll tell you, the days off are wonderful. <laughs> I mean, that is just a whole new adventure for me. Um, but I am, I'm so used to having so many tries at something that you, you learn, not only do you learn it and then become comfortable in it, we were just talking about the schedule, your muscle memory, your, your, um, just your faculties get used to it. And that's when the real work begins because then you sink deeper and deeper and you, you hear something for the first time, three months into a run, a year and a half into a run, you're, um, you're 
meditating on stage about a memory from when you were three. I mean, that's just, this is the reality of doing eight shows a week. You start to learn things that are so deep within you through these characters and through this, um, this exercise, which mm -hmm. is very meditative, to play something over and over and over again. Um, so this is not that. This is a, a jump off a cliff every night and hoping you'll, you'll land again. Um, and what do you learn in those moments? And this is also very useful to me. Both um, Akhenaten and The Hours are um, not unique in that they have living composers attached to them, obviously, but they both do. Um, obviously, The Hours was a new work, so I imagine Kevin was around a lot. Um, was he a, sort of playing a direct role in the process of creating the opera as you were in rehearsal? Absolutely. He and Greg Pierce both. Greg Pierce was in the room every single day, all day, and Kevin was often with the orchestra in the other room. Um, and making adjustments, I mean, it was so beautiful to be able to voice certain concerns or, you know, maybe there was a, a note with a certain vowel sound on it that might have been a little easier if, if the word was changed or the note was changed. And so you had these two people who were very collaborative in the room who would um, consider those changes and sometimes make them. Amazing. And I... I guess with Philip Glass, it was probably locked in by the time 2016 rolled around, or was he, was he there? Uh, it was locked in, but the thing about Philip Glass that's really extraordinary, it, and, and I discovered this about his music when I, when I did Akhenaten, is that he leaves an enormous amount of space. And that, to me, is the mark of a genius, because what you do with that space is create. Um, and so... Even though it was written, um, I had to come up with a story, which I told, and an arc of a character, which is which wasn't there, which I thought at first was a default, and then I realized that there is material in the orchestration and in the vocal writing that you can use, but you can use it however you want to. So for someone creative, it becomes very exciting. So I met with the librettist, um, Shalom Goldman, and talked to him about what is this source material, where did you get it, and um, talked to Philip Glass as well about what he was thinking. And, and all of those creators. And then we, because there was so much space, we were able to make the production that we did, which is, I think, what got people into the music. There was also a lot of material in the costumes. <laughs> we made up for any minimalism with the costume. <laughs> they were fabulous. And Kelly, you're, uh, that reminds me of costumes in the hours. Your costume change in act two was theatrical, remarkable, and moving. And I don't think I've ever said that about a costume change before. How did that come about, the staging of that? Was that always going to be on stage? Um, yes. In, before I say I just want to point out that how these things are connected. They were both directed by Phelan McDermott, as he mentioned. But Phelan was in London working on something with Philip Glass. And because Philip Glass had written the score for the film, The Hours, yes. um, you know, and people are busy and don't know what job they're going to next, he was with Phelan not too long ago, and Phelan was going to come over and start rehearsals. Kevin's been writing this score for five years, but <laughs> Philip Glass said, am I supposed to be doing something for that? <laughs> <laughs> so th that was very funny. That's yes, great. to the costume change, which was extraordinary. I, I have to admit, Annie B. Parson, who beautifully choreographed with all of these gorgeous women on the stage, um, really internalizing, externalizing all our internal uh, thoughts, um, we knew that she has to change, and I think if you know the story, um, it works both ways. If you know that little Richie is Richard and that I'm the mother, I know, and it works both ways because if you know, then you see how we mirror the whole show. I'm mirroring, when I'm making a cake with Richie, she's meeting with Richard in his apartment. When, when, he's, when he's dying, I'm, when he's saying, I hope I can write a story someday, I'm reading mm. my story. Maybe a girl will read it someday. I mean, it's all mirrored that we're connected. And um, when he falls out the window, I fall back on the bed. You know, it's it's all there. But if you don't know, then when this costume change happens, it couldn't happen off stage because then enters a woman you haven't met before. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, who's this woman? Mm -hmm. it is, is it the same actress or singer that played Laura Brown? We don't know. And I showed up, and they, they had mapped out this this change. And... I, I didn't understand, you know, a, a wig change with, with no, no pins, no nothing. And the Met uses these amazing magnets, you know. And so 
you know, they, I, I left stage, I changed out of a real dress and put on a mock dress that had, you know, Velcro and, and slits and you couldn't tell. It was so beautifully made that looked just like the other dress I was wearing. But if I moved too much, it would go. <laughs> so, so all during the previous scene, you know, I'm with, with Richie and my husband with the cake. I'm all, don't touch me too much. I'm just going to walk like this. Um, and then the dancers start and it's this thing that Phelan talks about, these, these attitudes of, of presentation and, and feeling and emotion, one of them is to radiate, to radiate something that you want to express, right? To, to ra and, and me, Laura Brown choosing to radiate a new life and uh, to, to the audience, uh, hope for and basically build a new life for herself, to leave and start again. She brings this, these dancers on and they, they transform her. The years pass and in, our, in front of our eyes, they changed me from, from Laura in, the 19, in 1949 to Laura in the 90s. And um, so by the time I, as you, never, you watch the whole thing, and by the time I walk through the door, we're, I'm in now Clarissa's world. And I, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, it was remarkable. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead to a question I was going to ask later be, because you mentioned work during the lockdown. And, and I think both of you, distinguished yourselves um, during that period. Um, you know, many artists I know just sort of froze up and they didn't do work. They were busy, you know, doom scrolling and washing their groceries and, you know, all the things that we were all probably doing, but um, they just didn't have the drive to create at all during that, especially that initial few months. But you two, um, in a in addition to all your personal demands, we're continuing to work. Anthony, tell us about the New York Phil bandwagon and, and how that brilliant concept that got a lot of deserved attention um, originated. Well, um, you know, I was, after a couple of months of nothing, I mean, a lot of online things, I was frustrated because I would walk outside. We had started going outside and we were in masks or whatever. And I would think, well, I just don't understand why we can't have live music because everybody's out here. And it would be significant if one of the leading musical organizations in the country did it, if it wasn't just a little thing. And um, I also saw, and actually this part was created before George Floyd happened, you know, the opportunity to connect for a major institution and tell some different stories in different places in different ways because music couldn't necessarily happen in this huge scale, but it could happen in a grassroots way. So I had the great opportunity to talk to Deborah Borda, who has become a friend of mine, and she's the president um, and CEO of the New York Philharmonic. And I was on the phone with her and I said, so I have an idea. Um, and I said, it's not a great idea and it's not a revolutionary idea. It's kind of a simple idea, which is that we could take a pickup truck and put people on the back of it and with a little bit of light and a little bit of sound have members of the New York Philharmonic go all around the city. We won't announce where it's going to be so we won't be congregating hundreds and thousands of people. We'll just see who shows up and it'll be like a litmus test. If these aren't New York Phil subscribers and we're in the Bronx, what will people think of classical music? Let's go, let's film it and let's see how people respond to it. And also, how do we define classical music? We need to be telling more stories. So let's commission composers that can speak in different voices than we're used to hearing musical voices. Um, and let's go to different communities and partner with different organizations there so that we're not just showing up and saying, hey, don't you love our Beethoven? But rather we're being presented in partnership with an organization who might curate or suggest a guest artist. So we organized concerts, um, which I will just tell you, I, <laughs> I, Deborah Borda said to me, okay, uh, and I said, we'll call it the bandwagon. She said, great, I'm going to give you a small budget. You take the budget and make this initiative. So I, for about 18 hours a day, created this thing. I drove all around the city and the city refused to give us any permits <clears throat> to park our truck anywhere. So um, there was the day I went to Deborah Borda and I said, look, 
if you want to do this, you're going to have to tell your lawyers that it's okay for us to park in front of a fire hydrant, which we know will be an available spot, and I will canvas the city and find all the fire hydrants that are next to a public gathering place. And she said, okay, let's take the risk. You know, it's COVID, whatever. And I said, great. So I would drive in the zip car around the city for days and days, and I found all the spots and I would map them out. Anyway, long story short, we created this initiative called Bandwagon, and we did over 100 performances in every borough um, and commissioned nine new works and um, had countless guest artists. And um, it, it was great because it was the convergence. I, we were just talking about this of a lot of things. It wasn't just about the music. It was about how did we package it? What was the marketing? What was the true engagement with the community? And how did that connect to the marketing? How did that connect to the mission of the orchestra? How could it become New York City's orchestra and continue that mission? So we were able to bring these things all together. And I was excited when it all of a sudden was getting you know, five New York Times articles or Good Morning America or whatever it was. But it struck a chord in the right way. And, and it was thrilling to connect to all those people. Sorry, that was a long... Not at all. And I think you're wrong. It was a great idea. Yeah. Um, and and it, it speaks to your multidimensionality, again, across disciplines as producer and creator, um, which, which is so inspiring. And Kelly, for you during, during COVID, in, additioning, in addition to having two kids at home and a husband... Um, three. Yeah. <laughs> He's I, one of his best friends. So I right. wish Greg were here. I'll have to tell him that. Uh, that's I have to that's say really that true. It was 20 years ago tomorrow that I had my first date with my husband, and Jeff was there that oh. night. <laughs> I know you, you've got questions about that. <laughs> I happened to run into them at Joe's Pub while they were on their first date. I'll never forget it. Um, but during during COVID, in addition to all your personal responsibilities, you were not just developing your work on the hours. You were working, presumably, on preparing for the Gilded Age, your web series, The Accidental Wolf. And I understand you have another project in the offing that you were working on as far back as COVID lockdown. Speak to that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I did try to stay busy. It was very busy getting my kids in school, an online school and doing all of that. And then in the other hours of the day, you know, trying to make connections. And and it it was a good time to work on the music for the hours, you know, to sit and, and look at that. But it changed. It changed along the way. When we, when we did it in Philly, it changed. And um, those were all good things. And being creative was what was feeding my soul. It wasn't monetarily uh, good, and I worried a lot about that. But it was... It was their creati creativity. And so any project I was on, like The Accidental Wolf, he was writing more, wanted to shoot more in safe ways outdoors or do something because it, he needed to be creative. Arian Moyet, I'm talking about the creator of that. And then we did shut down production for The Gilded Age that March, but we were up and shooting again by September. And so then we got started with that. But we actually have to laugh because we're talking, about, what did you do over the pandemic? Well, we did the... Oh, right. We did a thing together, but we had no idea. We sang a duet, <laughs> we in we fact. We actually sang a duet. <laughs> wow. With technology, I sang my part, then he sang his, and they put it out there. And so we actually collaborated without ever collaborating. <laughs> yeah. But I'm now going to put that on my resume that I've collaborated <laughs> yeah. with Kelly O'Hara. Well, it was the Adam, the Adam Gettle Myths and Hymns uh, through the Master Voices. We, we did one number there together. So th stuff like that, were, they were gifts. You know, the, the Sondheim birthday party that was... Or, or just being in rooms, I, with sometimes with Zoom rooms, where I'd set up my little sound machine and uh, sound system and have my pianist record tracks, then send them to me, then I'd push play, then I'd sing a song spotty, mm -hmm. spottily. But um, those nights I just felt so grateful to be making a connection with art. It did feel like a connection. It felt more than, not the same as being in person, but it was something. Yeah, I remember yeah. you... I admired your setup when you, you spoke to the graduating class of 2020 over Zoom when we did a virtual toast the year you, you received your honorary doctorate in absentia. Um, but yeah, you looked like you had a pretty swank setup there with your, your lighting. Well, I'm and a your... technical Luddite, but I'm telling you, I learned so many things so quickly out of yeah. the need to, to keep you know moving forward artistically. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
we're, we're talking about cross currents and multidimensionality and cross discipline work. And, you know, I, it got me thinking about you too, got me thinking about what the elements are that go into making someone who can do that. There are so many artists who are, you know, in a box, perhaps, perhaps happily in a box doing one thing, one discipline. Um, you two are different and, and because we're at MSM and because we have some students in the room with us, musical theater students are here, um, I, I thought we should go back to education and, you know, talk about perhaps what in your education prepared you to be um, this versatile in your, um, in your careers. And, and Kelly, I'll start with you. I'm thinking about your work in, in your native Oklahoma with your teacher, um, the late Francis, uh, Florence Birdwell um, at Oklahoma City University, who you've often cited as such an important person in your career development. Do you, do you think you can credit her a little bit with having you think bigger than just one career um, path? Of course. I mean, I, I don't think that I ever thought of I, I was just saying in the room, I've always felt a little bit like I didn't fit in in one particular place. I mean, I grew up, nobody was doing anything artistic. And I, I think I was singing country western or in the church, anywhere I could try to find a song to sing that someone might listen to. Um, but then when I went to school and met her, and I knew that I would go to school to meet her. I, I learned about her when I was a small child. It was, it was something I got set in my mind that she would be the, and she was. Mm -hmm. um, she really set me on a path to... Just listen to who I was. Uh, she really helped me break down a lot of walls around myself of expectation or, or anyone else's for that matter, which was probably even a louder noise than my own. Mm -hmm. um, and so she switched me to being an opera major. I came in as a musical theater major, but my voice is somewhere in between, to be honest. I, wasn't, I definitely wasn't singing pop, um, and I never have. And I, 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 boy, I tried. Boy, I, tr I tried to sing Whitney Houston songs all the day long, and it just sounded awful. So, so we, I went ahead and got my, um, my opera degree, and she sent me up. My very first trip to New York in my life, I was 21 years old. I was a junior in college, and I came to tour this university to go to get my master's. Um, but I didn't want to get a master's in opera. I wanted to be an actor, and I wanted to go to Broadway. So we lo she lost that battle. And I ended up moving straight here after college, and, and I enrolled in Strasbourg Theater Institute. And, and the, the rest is history, really. Um, but she was the person who, when I did say, I just want to go, you know, she ripped up my, my application to the master's program, and she said, just go, follow your heart. But then when I got my first Broadway show, which was a pop musical, she said, well, let's get down to work. Let's, let's, let's make sure you do it healthily. Let's make sure you can get through and do this show. This is your job now, and you're going to be the best version of you you can be. And it sort of got me thinking about how we put, we put eat people in boxes and we put ourselves in boxes. Oh, well, I need to sound like this. Mm -hmm. I need to sound like, no, I was going to do me in that show because she said, you can, mm -hmm. you're going to do your version of this because the other way is you're going to, we're going to fail. Right. And so she set me on this path of thinking about trying to do new things, but with the idea that it wasn't exactly the way it's always been done, but just to try to do it as I do it. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Anthony? Um, Anyone at MSM, perhaps, that... <laughs> well, um, I, you know, I connect with that a lot because I feel I'm out of the box in many ways, um, especially as a countertenor. Countertenor is already one, one rung out of the box. And then my particular sound and my particular temperament don't fit into the norm. And, um, and so I, I have, I have a who's still at MSM, uh, who I've been with for, I keep forgetting, I think 24 years. I first went to her when I was 16. Uh, don't do the math. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and she saw something there in me. And we went through so many, many things together. And she always kept me connected to who I was, even though she was introducing me to the sort of... Uh, 
real foundation of the art form. And I love that. Um, but I'd had such a, a varied past before I even got to Joan. I had been on Broadway as a kid and doing musical theater. And then I started to do opera when I was 13. I got roped into The Turn of the Screw, which was a fascinating piece. And my parents were both psychologists. And so... <laughs> They wow. helped me understand. I mean, it was fascinating because we would drive to the opera and I would say, but, you know, what's this narrative of abuse, basically, and, and how, and we talk about all the nuances of it. Then I had to figure out how to express them as a performer. So I was really fascinated by that. And then when I was 15, I got asked to be in this film with this called Merchant Ivory. And they're an amazing film company. And James Ivory, the director, taught me so much about the visual world, which I'd never connected to as an artist, you know, how important that was. And it was dance, and it was fashion, and it was art, and it was all the things that were missing from my, you know, repertoire. So by the time I got to Joan, I had all of these other perspectives that I was really intrigued by that were other disciplines. And Joan was con constantly trying to ground me in opera have me understand that if I wanted, and when I came to MSM, if I wanted to be a part of this world, I had to at least put one foot into it and not stay only on the outskirts. And so that's been really the model for my career is how I could have, be a part of a, an institution, a part of a, an, uh, an art form that was so traditional and honor those traditions. And then with my other hand, embroider them. And, um, and I'll just tell you my favorite Joan story which is we were up in MSM in, and I was having a really bad day with singing and I was so frustrated and I said, Joan, do you think I'll ever sing at the Met? And she sat and, and looked out her window in her, in her studio and, and then took a long pause and said, no. <laughs> <laughs> which was just so great and I have to say that it made me really determined uh, and I wanted to understand, like, you know, uh, well, okay, I thought, okay. And I got so determined, and I wanted to sing these coloratura fast arias, and I couldn't sing them, and I got so frustrated. But then I took the time, and I, I worked with her on every aspect. And really, the more you give someone like Joan, the more she gives back. Mm -hmm. And we built it, built it, built it. And so you can imagine she was there when I won the Met competition and made my debut and she was there for every minute of it. And it's been really a fun journey. Damn straight she was. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, another quality, uh, um, building blocks, I would think, and, and this is a quality that I think you both have, the New York Times actually called you out for being a courageous performer, but courage. Um, it takes huge dedication, hard work, talent to, to do what you're both doing. Um, but it also takes guts. Kelly, you were an established musical theater star. Tony, multiple Tony nominee, a, a Tony Award winner. And you strolled across the plaza from Lincoln Center Theater to the Met Opera, knowing the demands of the Met audience, the, the operati, you know, the op opera critics, knowing those demands. And you just, you, you went over there and, and you made it happen and with great success. Do you remember that first, um, that first moment when the, when the, curtain rose on your first performance in the, at the Met, and were you at all nervous? I mean, you never seemed to be, but that you had to s screw your Wonderful courage to actress. this taking place. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm scared every single moment. Um, I, I've likened this experience in my mind to, to throwing myself in a fire. <laughs> I, I, I often say, what, what do you think you're doing? Why are you, why are you doing this just because you can or someone let you? And I think that's, someone let me. We should all just acknowledge that. I've been let into the building. Um, <laughs> but I think if someone says you can come in and you choose not to go in, won't you wonder for the rest of your life if you, you didn't do it? And I, I was singing in a certain way that I never meant to in college where I was singing art song and arias and doing the operas there. And, and it all just happened to me, but it, it really was something that was part of me. And 
then I went away to do something else and and wasn't quite fitting in there. And so I end up in revivals or new shows or something that are written. But I thought to myself, well, what if I'm not seeing something through? You know, and I remember we laughed. Mrs. Birdwell, before she passed away, she had gone through many years of dementia. And so I hadn't really heard from her in a long, long time. Not from her. She was still alive at this point. We lo I lost her in 20 2020. But she... I remember I, here I am at Lincoln Center for three or four shows, Broadway shows, at, and I would look across to the stage door over there, and you know we joked years ago. I'd say, well, "Well, I'll just go walk through the back door. I'm just going to go walk over there and go through the back door and see what happens." And when I made that that Met debut, um, and it was an operetta, it was it was Mary Widow. You know, we spoke and everything, and but. Still, I was standing on that stage, and I there these flowers arrived, and the card said, "You got through the back door," mm. and I it's the I don't know how it happened because she hadn't really been very lucid in a long, long time, but that's what the card said, and I, I can't no one can explain it to me. Who, who, um, but they was they were from her. Um, but what I do know is that to sit in that opera house and to watch is ten times more scary because when you stand on the stage i remember standing on the stage and thinking i know what it means to be on a stage mm. and it, and all of a sudden i felt better mm. now i can't worry i don't read reviews thank god i can't worry about how much sound you're hearing i can't worry about how small my voice is i can't worry about if the accent is correct in the italian or whatever it is i just have to do my best mm. and that's all i'm trying to do and land on my feet in any way, but I'm not doing it to, I, I think I'm just doing it because I just want to keep evolving. That's what it is. Fantastic. Anthony, um, I'm going to sort of reverse the equation here. You moving from the Met Opera stage to a sort of intimate, let's use St. Anne's Warehouse, a two-hander, um, uh, an octave apart, fantastic you're you're in it it's a completely different milieu is that something you have to adjust to or is it like kelly says it's a stage and you're comfortable on stage um well i think that there is an instinct you develop over years or it develops within you of how to be on stage but um only an octave apart was a really special project um that i did while i wasn't doing bandwagon over the pandemic um this amazing cabaret performer justin vivian bond who's a kind of legend uh in new york and one of the greatest cabaret singers of their generation they have always been a kind of icon to me. And when I, I got a record deal one day and I made a classical album, the first one, and it was really fun and we built a big project around it. And then they said, do you want to do another? And I said, yeah, but I want to do something different and I don't know what it is. But I wanted to have the kind of exhilaration of rock music, but still be classical, but also have humor, like Victor Borga, but have the kind of ability to reach people the way Bernstein did with his... And I went on this whole thing, and then I realized that Vivian, when we'd become friends and we performed together at Joe's Pub once, and um, they had said to me once, well, we're kind of like... Carol Burnett and Julie Andrews at Carnegie Hall, you know, you're Julie Andrews and you're very, everything's wonderful and it's perfect and it's beautiful. And I'm just Carol Burnett and I come in and say, you know, well, what do you think? Um, and so I thought about that model and so we created this show called Only an Octave Apart and we stole that uh, because Dear Joan, my voice teacher said, well, not only was there Carol and Julie, but Carol did a special with Bubbles, Beverly Sills, live at the Met. And I watched that whole special, and they start the whole thing with a song that's, we're only an octave apart. Um, and it was hilarious. And so to have a trans woman singing in a gravelly voice, and then uh, an impish man singing in a countertenor voice was a kind of hilarious. And we built a whole show around it. We built an album around it and we took it to St. Anne's Warehouse and then we just took it in the fall to um, London where we uh, we did a, a big run of it and now it will continue on. So we're, um, it was thrilling, but the, to answer your question, what I realized doing that show is that 
I had never been so much myself on stage. You know, you're playing a character, but also within the classical idiom that I sing, um, how was I, and I wasn't, expressing my identity? And my identity as a queer person or my identity as a gay person informs a lot of things about me and probably how I make musical decisions and classical music and all kinds of other aesthetic things. But I had never really been that identity as myself on stage. And doing that with Viv, all of a sudden I was with someone who is only themselves and so powerfully themselves. And standing across from that and doing that with them, I realized how important that is. And I read a quote by Louise Bourgeois that I'll end this with that, um, that said something like, I can't remember exactly, but art should never be about art. It should be about the human. And I think that is what I learned doing this with Viv. So often, like what you said, we're trying to live up to our own, you know, demons or other people's expectations or an idea of perfection. And you get much better when you just say, this is what I've got, this is who I am, and I'm going to do the best that I can do with it. Kelly, when you're at doing a show, a cabaret performance, say at the Carlisle, do you feel because you're you're you you're not you can't hide behind a character do you feel more exposed and is that sort of more of a sort of disarming those are my favorite things yeah no i i love playing characters i love playing roles um but i think it's it can be surprising um my cabaret or things like that because i tend to play similar types of roles that's that's i mean we all do we we until we beg to not but I have played, a, I've played Laura Brown a lot, you know. Um, and when I do a cabaret show, I might sing a song that I wrote or I might sing a song that my husband wrote or I might talk about, you know, the way I feel I want to be stronger. You know, I want to, I have a lot to say. I'm, a, I'm a, a mother and I'm a professional woman and I've worked in this industry for a long time and I have more to say than you know, um, than sometimes what I get to play. And it's amazing the response, you know, sometimes people don't want to hear those things from me, which is why I want to do, do my own shows. <laughs> yeah. We, unfortunately, we, we are winding down here. We're, we're out of time, but I, I want to say that, um, in addition to courage and education and talent and commitment, there's got to be a level of necessity as well, right? I mean, it's. It, um, I'm going to read this quote because it's short, but I liked it. Anthony, you have said that countertenor roles are limited to work before 1750 and after 1950. So there's a paucity of, of roles, perhaps. Um, so does that force you, does necessity, you know, to work as an artist, does that force you out of um, the opera world and push you into exploring other... Uh, other milieu. I feel very fortunate that I'm a counter tenor because if I'd been a soprano, maybe I would have sung Tosca all over the world. Um, and now I can't do that. How can I make a living, you know, even, you know, at the Met, unless I make a name for myself in some out of the box way. So either I have to make new pieces that augment the paucity of possibility or, um, or I'm nothing. And so I've been forced to do that. And now that's what I consider the most fun. I love that. And, and Kelly, there's got to be some part of the old fashioned, an actor needs to work gumption. Let's put on a show that comes into continuing to work the way you are. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are stories that have been told over and over and over again that it, I hope that when I go try to tell them, we can find some new lens to tell them in or be part of telling that story maybe somehow. But, but aside from that, I want to be part of telling other people's stories, supporting that, moving forward. Um, I'm, I'm also not 25 anymore, so telling that story all the time is also something that, um, that now I need to graduate out of. And, and so when those, those 
roles dry up for someone like me instead of chasing youth. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's better for me to chase change and chase chase different things and be in support of that and be in collaboration with and and find new ways to tell the feminine story um, and in ways that have not been told before. So necessity always is the mother of invention, especially you, you saw artists during the pandemic and how creative people got. Um, it's because we, we will find a way to tell human stories um, no matter what. Um, and to tell our own stories, to help support other people telling theirs, that's, the, that's what I want to do. And that's why we keep reinventing. Otherwise, we're just telling the same ones over and over again. And what, um, I can't think of a better way to end this conversation. Thank you both so much for your work and for joining us this evening. And thank you all for coming.